Hello. I don't have any opening statement. Just fire away. Say that again. Yeah, um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. It's just you know, uh, DA and and uh, we just as an organization decided that we needed to change. And Pete's a fantastic coach. Uh, been with us for you know 17, 18 years. Done a lot of really, really good things, but we just felt like we needed to change. What about the offense? Kind of, you feel like dictated that change? Yeah, I just you know again, we just felt like we we can perform better, and and uh, yeah, we need a change in that area. Nicky, would that be along the same lines that uh, Coach Burns is the wide receiver? You thought they should have been more developed. Yeah, again, I think, you know, I'm not going to get into anything specific because I think <clears throat> all uh, three of those guys are good coaches, did a lot of good things, but uh, I think in the assessment we needed, you know, felt like we needed a, something a little different. What was, your, what was your overall take on this, this season as a whole? Yeah, it looks, uh, I, you know, I think that, um, I think our expectations were higher collectively. Um you know, we had some games that slipped away from us and, and a couple we didn't perform in well. And just, you know, it's a variety of reasons, that's all. So when you look at a season, you look at you know, um, how you perform, there's so many variables and, you know, it just wasn't good enough ultimately. Did, we didn't achieve what uh, our expectations. Three straight years now of missing the playoffs, and there was, a, I think, a study posted yesterday that you guys had the oldest roster in the entire NFL based on snaps played this year. Is there a feeling of a, you guys were going for a certain window with, with a lot of core players and, and the state of the NFC South, and, and maybe that needs to be rethought now? No, I listen, I see some of those stats sometimes, and I think that, look, you got to look beyond just whatever the raw number is. Got to look at you know the core of your team, um, and look a couple guys can skew that. So I, I don't look at that like we're an old team. I really don't. As far as the development uh, with Trevor Penning, yeah. Do you think it could be maybe take the same course as Andrews Pete, where I don't know if he's going to work out a tackle, but uh, we think he can be a starting offensive line. We might have to play guard. I know back in a day like Jim Dombrowski. Yeah, I, look, I think I think with any offensive lineman, you know, and there's a, some other positions where this is applicable too. You know, you you make an assessment and a vision of where you have them, and if that doesn't work out, you know, you look at their strengths and weaknesses. And say maybe we can we can place them there. I I think with Trevor, look, we didn't do him any favors. Um, you know, he comes as a rookie, he gets hurt. You know, he, he misses ten games. We play him the back half of that season. Um, primarily in a jumbo role, and he did some good things, and then he gets hurt, and he has no off season, and then we throw him in there as the starter, you know, week one. I, listen, I think, I think a lot of that falls on us in terms of, you know, where he was and what he was ready to do. And so um, I'm still pretty high on uh, Trevor Penning. I think we all are. But we recognize that, hey, look, we've got, we've got to do a better job in terms of development and preparing him to be ready. Uh, and I think we'll do that this off season. I think we'll have a good plan for him. Yeah. Uh, look, here's what I think. I think sometimes, you know, the easy thing to do, the lazy thing to do, is look at the results of a season and say, ah, oh, it's a coach's fault or it's the quarterback's fault. I think oftentimes you have to look beyond that. Um, well, I was, I was just look. I was prepared for this question, right? <laughs> Chuck Knoll, his first three years, Hall of Fame coach. He was one and thirteen, five and nine, six and eight. But they recognize that this guy's a good football coach, right? Bill Belichick. Here's his first three seasons: six and ten, seven and nine, seven and nine. Tom Landry, zero and eleven, four and nine, five and eight, four and ten, five and eight. Hall of Fame coaches, all of them. Bill Walsh, first year, two and fourteen. Second year, six and ten. So I think the easy thing to do is just look at the results and say, "Oh no, we've got to have a change." You got to look beyond that. You know, what are the reasons why we were nine and eight instead of 
you know, 13 and 4. And look, it's, it's collective. It's the players. It's the coaches. It's me. It's our personnel staff, our roster. It's variables sometimes that we don't have any control of. Um, and so I, I, my assessment is Dennis Allen is a good coach. And again, you know, with Sean Payton, we went 10 and 6 the first year, but then we were 7 and 9, 8 and 8, and I heard some of the same noise. But at the time, I knew we had a good football coach. And so I think sometimes the hard thing to do is to be patient and recognize your other shortcomings and get those fixed. And that's what we're doing. Can you spend some talk about like, the culture a little bit? What, what are some of the things with the culture that you feel like need to change? Yeah, I, I don't like the word culture necessarily because I think, look, we got really good guys, willing. Um, and I think, look, a lot of things that I said to the players, I'm sure you guys are aware of it, were for the players' ears only. Um, I think collectively, though, that everybody, you know, if you ask, do you want to win, everybody stands up. They raise their hand, right? Everybody says, what, are you willing to do what's necessary to win? They all raise their hand. But sometimes we're not doing the things that are necessary to win. And that's on me. That's on me 100%. We've got to... I've got to hold our guys to a standard um, to do the things necessary to win. And I think that I probably let that slip a little bit over the last few years. And so we're going we're gonna to get that recalibrated. And so that's my message to our entire building. It's not just to the players or just the coaches. It's to our entire building. Is some of that stuff like the extra homework to study and taking care of the body? Like well, there's a lot of things. And, and uh, I think I was pretty specific about what those things are, but that, that's really for their ears, not for your ears. Can I elaborate at all about how it's, it's on you if you don't deal with the players day-to-day? -day? Excuse me? Well, you said that it's on you, but since you're not the one dealing with those players day-to-day, -day and kind of you know, what's going on with the players. Well, look, I'm accountable for that. Um, you know, we have, we have a certain standard here, and, and, and look, some of it's out of our control. Um, you know, COVID... League rules. There's things that, that are out of our control, but that doesn't mean what we have to that we can't have an, a, a standard that we we set. And look, it starts with me. It does. And certainly, our our uh, head coach and our coaching staff and all the people in the building are responsible for it. But it it, it begins with me. Mickey, I don't know if this has been uh, addressed, but uh, going back to that, you don't like the word culture, but as far as the camaraderie uh, amongst uh, teammates. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at the victory formation and what occurs, and I don't know if this has been asked, like Jamal Williams, did he have an incentive, like you score X amount no. of touchdowns? So that, that didn't come into play. So it wasn't mm -hmm. like you score a touchdown, you get an extra 100000 or nothing. That, was, that wasn't it. No, look, that, I think that this has been talked about way too much, frankly. Look, I, I get it. Players wanted to get do a favor for uh, uh, you know, one of their teammates and probably didn't think it completely through. Um, I would rather we not do that, but it was, there was no underlying message to that. It was all exactly what it appeared to be. They're trying to do a favor for a teammate, get him a touchdown, and I just wasn't appropriate in, in my view. But it, it's it's overblown, you know. I don't. I think it's overblown. No, I just brought up the monetary reasons. No, there was no there was nothing. There was no incentive or any. There's no financial reward. I remember I had started twelve games. If you scored one touchdown? No, if I, if, I, if, I, if I took the first snap, if I took the first snap, and it's the things they want me to play. Goes, oh, I know you banged yeah, up me. Yeah, uh, that doesn't happen here. And, and yeah, We're not doing that. And I said, I'm playing. I said, yeah. you shoot me up, whatever. I'm uh, playing, I'm going to get that money. So yeah. That's why I said that you get so... I understand the question, but that's not, that's not part of the equation. The things can change when it comes to potential offensive coordinator coming in the building, but were the moves that y'all made on the offensive side of the coaching staff yesterday the only moves that you intend to make at this time? Yeah, I, I don't know that that's the case yet. You know, we're... Yeah, I don't... I'm not anticipating anything either way. Yeah, I know a, another phrase you probably dismiss as, as being overused, lost the locker room, and, and I thought you kind of dismissed that the other night, but so. is that... You say most people should be able to look beyond the results, but I mean, players have felt the effects of three losing seasons too, and you felt the need to have this talk with them after the season. Is that a danger with with players not believing that this coach, you know, coaching staff will have the answers when when you go through three losing seasons? I mean, is that something yeah, I'm not worried about that. I mean, you feel confident that this mm -hmm. team stays. Yeah. You Look, I, 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 there's a lot of things about our team that I really, really like too. So. 
Look, I like that, that we played hard. I like that we finished uh, four out of the last five. Um, effort, um, you know, those kinds of things that happen in games. Even when things were going poorly, we're, we're, we're really good. Um, got a lot of, you know, I had a lot of individual talks with players, and, and I came away from those feeling really positive about a lot of things. You said, you, said uh, you wanted to change offensively. Are you referring to like a, a kind of a step away from what y'all have done for a long time here with Sean and, and Pete, or, or is this just a, just a matter of getting a new set of eyes? In? Yeah, uh, I think that remains to be seen. How concerned you are uh, with the future of Ryan Ramchick, always one of your top linemen, and with his knee issue? Yeah, I think, look, anytime you have a good player who's going through uh, you know, a tough thing um, health-wise, you're always concerned. Um, and yet, you know, I have a positive feeling about where, where he's going to end up. And I think he does as well. Mickey, when it comes to the, the offense coordinator, it's obviously been a long time since there's been a change in that regard. Is, is that search different from, say, a position coach? Is there a bit more weight to it, and do you approach it differently? Um, yeah, I mean, it's different because the responsibilities are different. Um, you know, particularly when you have a defensive head coach and you're looking for an offensive coordinator. Yeah, just no different than when, when Sean was a head coach and we, you know, we went through uh, searches for defensive coordinators. So, yeah, it, it, it's different. What are you looking for in the next offensive coordinator? I mean, coming off of the, you know, part of the ways the guy that was around for 18 years it gives you an opportunity to really know what it is that you like. Yeah. What are you um, looking for in the next guy? Yeah, I think we have a set of criteria um, that a lot of different guys can fill. We're just kind of going through that process now, so I think I'll leave it at that. How did you view Derek's first year during the Wolves? Yeah, I think he did a lot of good things, and, and uh, wasn't perfect for certain, but he did a lot of good things. And, and listen, I think that um, he was hurt uh, for a good portion of the season, um, probably more so than you know he would let on or that or, or that was out there. So uh, I felt like. He kind of hit a stride toward the end, and and we did collectively too. So, um, and he's not the only um, um, player or position that 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 was the case for. Were you surprised how well Andrews Pete played at left tackle? Because usually you don't talk about him. I mean, he's doing his job, and I, I thought he was outstanding considering that you know mean he's a guard, and then how he finished the whole season at left tackle. Yeah, I would I would say yeah. You know, he gets he gets thrown back out there. Um, and did and did a good job. He, he did. Um, really pleased with that. And I think I think that gives him some confidence as well. Every off season is a balancing act between putting together the best roster and staying fiscally responsible. Yeah. Do you ever get to the point where, when you're over the cap every off season, where you look at it and say, you, you mean know, like every year? <laughs> What's that? You mean like every year? Yeah, like every year. Where you say maybe. We need to look at the financial foundation for the future yeah. and maybe make some tough decisions with older players and count on our player development and drafting and free agency and roll the dice a little, counting on younger people to yeah. evolve. Yeah, I think, I, yeah, we go through that process every, every year in the off season, And, you know, I've said this before, is that... Um, we had kind of a vision and a plan for post Drew Brees, and then you know COVID hits and we get this big setback relative to the uh, the cap and finances, and so that's that's caused us to recalibrate a little bit. But the answer to the question is yes, we do do that. Um, I'm not going to tell you what we're doing, but we do do that. And, and we have you know we have to make up some ground. There's no question. You know, over a period of time here, we're going to have to make up some ground cap wise. What's the thinking behind uh, the timing of reworking Marshawn Latimer's bonus, like while the season was still going on, and making it an option bonus? Like, I mean, obviously, some of those. Yeah, it's just, it's just cap management. You know, I don't want to get into details of it. But there wasn't a, a purpose to be like that. Free yeah, yeah, there's a purpose. I'm not going to tell you what the purpose is. It's just it's just cap it's just cap management that's what it is. Since 2017 draft was incredible. Since then, how would you evaluate what you've done since then, and will you will you tweak your philosophy as far as the draft 
have you evaluated that as to what you might do to maybe get some more results there? Yeah. Um, well, look, I think a number of these drafts, you know, the the results have yet to be written. Um, and look, 2017 was incredible, right? It. it uh, I don't expect to duplicate that every year. I'd like to duplicate that every year, but don't have that expectation. So, um, no, I, I think our philosophies are sound, and, and I don't see that changing. Yeah, I was just curious. It, it, it didn't come out yesterday, but maybe it, it wouldn't. Or is anybody on the current staff up for the OC job? I mean, is, or is that not? Yeah, I, I'm going to keep that list to ourselves right now. Um, but it'll, you know, those candidates will come out eventually. Okay, how about uh, with Coach Marone? Um, there are a lot of fans have asked me like uh, how he's developing the offensive line and you know guys putting up their expectations. And I mean, I don't know, it's just a rumor. Like, oh, he might end up retiring the uh, all the years that he's coach of. So, where do you think Coach Marone's at along with the offensive line right now? Yeah, I think he's a fantastic coach. I do, and I haven't heard anything about him retiring. So that would be a surprise to me. You mentioned some of the stats earlier about like maybe not paying attention to them. You've seen this league evolve over decades. Yeah. Where do you kind of, or how do you reconcile the data-driven analytics versus kind of that gut feel, so to say? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, look, I, 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 I think that analytics have been around a long, long time, way longer than we've been talking about them. Um, they, were, they existed in 1983 when I started. We just didn't call them analytics. Um, I think it's 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 a tool in the toolbox, right? And you have to um, view it as such. And so I just look at it. And look, we got a lot more data, a lot more information than we did certainly then. And even in the last you know three or four years, we got a lot more um, data to, that we need to pay attention to. And so we do. But it's a tool in the toolbox. And there's still, um, you know... It, some of these analytics tell you to go for it on every fourth down, right? Well, what if you don't have a fourth down play that you like, <laughs> right? <laughs> what if you have an, a player that's injured at a particular position that's key to – so there, there's just a lot of factors and variables. And so I look at uh, analytics as valuable, but a tool in the toolbox. Can I ask, you just referenced 1983. But people ask this question and, you know, rumors get out there with social media and stuff like that. You've been doing this a long time. Your role is not changing here. You seem energetic about recalibrating the organization. The front office is staying the same as far as your position. Yeah, I saw a couple of things. That was just made up, whatever. I saw. I know what you're referencing. Somebody just made that up. That's never been discussed or talked about. Now, am I slower? Yeah, I probably ran a 4.5 when I was 30, and I don't think I could run 5 flat right now. So I am slower. But, Yeah. You know, I've, get, I've been asked that question. You get asked that when you get to a certain age, right? Whatever age that is. And I've said, look, I'm just going to wake up one morning and say this is the day. And it's not going to be tomorrow, but everything for the next 10 years is open. We'll see. Vicky, uh, when you were asked about DA earlier, you mentioned the stats with other coaches' careers, but what are some of the things he's done the last two years or some of the qualities he has that led you to believe that he can get the team back to the playoffs? Yeah, well, um, I, you know, I think the things that the head coach is responsible for, you know, game day management, um, scheduling, all the things that you guys don't see that I see or that we see internally, I feel good about. And, yeah, there, there are certainly areas that he can pr improve in. Um, but, look, we've had a quarterback change. We've had, you know, some things changed in the last two, two or three years. And so we got to look at ourselves and say, okay, what, what's our expectations? Are they realistic? And... If we're not meeting those expectations, what can we do differently? And I don't believe that uh, um, that that that's the head coach right now. I think I like I like Dennis Allen. I think he's a good you're coach. An offensive coordinator. Uh, do you share that with uh, with Derek Carr as far as his input and what he thinks, or is it like okay, you make the decision and then he has to accept it, or is he involved in that? Yeah, we we don't ask our players to make decisions. We don't. Um, that, that's not. That's not a burden. That's not a burden that we put on them. Now we do talk to. We talk to a lot of our veteran players about the season, about the things that we expect from them, and and they should ha certainly have expectations from us. But we're not asking them to do any evaluations of any kind. I mean, just to kind of 
rephrase that a little bit. Well, Derek Carr's, you know, whatever offense coordinator you go with, Derek's obviously got to be a big factor in that decision, right? Like, he's got to be able to work with that. Like, well, look, look when, when we make a hire, when Dennis makes a hire, certainly he's going to make the hire that'll, be, that'll work for him. But that's not, that'll be our assessment. That won't be, we're not going to ask him if he approves it of A, B, or C, right? Does that make sense? When you guys do hire the OC, will the OC have them put on some of the openings, like maybe guys that he would want to bring with them? How, how does that come? Yeah, we'll see. We'll see where that goes. If you do, and again, things that are out there, I know you can't talk about coaches, but John Gruden's name keeps popping up. How much of it has to be you know him as a person, but knowing the situation and what happened and how he feels about it, just from a news perspective, not yeah. even talking about him here. Yeah, it's, it's a fair question, but I, I, I don't really want to talk about any individual candidates for that role. Um, it, it's a fair question, but yeah, we'll answer that when, when we hire. How quickly do you expect that process to go? Is it, is it one where you would like to take a little bit more time doing it, or is it, I would think, another <coughs> yeah. kind of a rapid approach? Yeah, I, I think, look, one of the mistakes that our league in general makes is, you know, we're in a rush and a race to hire people because we're afraid of, you know, someone else, you know, being us to the draw. I think that's a mistake. I think the most important thing is get the right guy in the right situation. Take your time. Make sure it's a thoughtful, um, planned decision. So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna go through the process and we're gonna uh, make the right hire. Uh, we're not gonna make the expedient hire. Do you anticipate in, uh, restructuring Derek Carr's contract this off season? Um, I, I don't know. We're gonna have to restructure a lot of contracts. <laughs> yeah. He, he, but for him too. I mean, like in theory, he don't he could move on after. It just yeah. seems like with that one, there's a pretty big. Yeah, well, that, that's all part of cap management that you know we've got to deal with. Follow up on the you know the length of time, the process, the evaluations. Uh, you know, just because it gets asked a lot, why does it take as long as it does? So you view kind of being intentional about all that as a strength of of this kind of institution yeah. of taking your time, making sure you get the right. So what's the question? Is that that's something you view as a strength in terms of you know it's not necessarily you know just kind of twiddling your thumbs like there's a process that you go through and yeah you know, I, I just think that that. Um, you know, any decision of this magnitude, it just has to be a thoughtful, well thought out process, right? And you have to, you know, look, there's an obvious group of candidates, right? But there's another group of candidates that might not be quite so obvious that we need to make sure that we take a look at. And um, we'll do that. Have you always been that deliberate, or is that something you learned? I'm pretty deliberate. I've always been deliberate. I think that was one of Sean's complaints about me occasionally is that. I'm too deliberate and he's too impatient. So it was good. It was a good match, right? Yeah. Well, with your front office energy for office yeah. is that how you're kind of approaching that? Do you anticipate any changes? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Look, there we've got great candidates inside our building, um, Kai and Jeff, and and even Michael Parenton. And so we have we have uh, some top flight um, executives in our building, and and. Um, I'm rooting for them to get an opportunity. Although if they get one, I'll probably rue it. So, I know Carolina announced they're interviewing Ty Harley, and I think it, I can't remember if it was announced or reported that Jeff Ireland interviewing with the Chargers. Yeah. Up, but have have they been asked for other interviews? Um, not not that no, they haven't yet. Just to peep for a second. Obviously, it's professional, but when you spend 18 years with somebody, there's a huge human component and personal yeah. relationship there. I yes. mean, not that I want like the full peek behind the curtain, but like how how emotional is that when you've been through so much with somebody? Yeah, that? it's really emotional. Um, Pete's such a, he's a great coach, not a good coach, he's a great coach, and he's he's done, you know, I think, listen, we had historically good offenses here for a long period of time, and Pete was a much bigger part of that than, than uh, he gets credit for. Um, Really brilliant. You know, look, his first game as a play caller, we, I think we scored 60 points. So, um, yeah, it's emotional. Uh, um, and he's such a good person and such a great representative of, of um, the organization for all these years. And it was emotional for me, that's for sure. And it was emotional for a lot of people.
By the way, I'm chewing this gum because I have a cough and it keeps me from coughing. Yeah, you plan in place for, I mean, I think Jeff's going to do it yeah. today. Uh, yeah. And then if you plan in place for lose one, lose two, I mean, you, know, you don't want them, you want them to, you know, yeah. proceed and be successful, but plan here if you lose really both. Yeah, they'll, I mean, again, that'll be a, um, a thoughtful, uh, intentional process if if one or or both uh, go so um, you know no different than it was when Terry Fontenot went to Atlanta and Ryan Pace went to Chicago and we've got you know great people um, behind you know those people too so I'm really confident in the people we have in the building and but that doesn't mean we won't look outside the building either. What was the overall assessment of the defense this this season? Yeah, I think it was, you know, a lot of good things, some ups and downs. Um, felt like we had some young players develop and improve, and, you know, I'm excited. I'm excited about um, the prospects for our defense. I, I really am. Well, that, you seem kind of fired up compared to some of these other meetings. But yeah. You have, you have a lot of challenges going forward, yeah. right? including a three-year drought from the playoffs. Yeah. How, how do you feel personally being the guy who's got to steward the organization through all of these challenges? Yeah, look, I'm excited about it. I'm, I'm excited about the prospects of, you know, the guys that are on the team and their um, – I'm excited about the willingness of all of our people, players, coaches, staff, to look inward and say, look, I've got to do better. Um, Yeah, including me, and so that gets me it gets me fired up. Look, I hate doing these press conferences. You guys know that. Um, so typically, I'm very stoic and unenthused, right? <laughs> but um, I think we need enthusiasm. I think we need you know a boost in energy and and excitement uh, in our building. And so that again, that you know all that stuff starts with me. Sorry, I interrupted you. Go ahead. Maybe uh, how much you appreciate uh, Ms. Gail Benson as an owner compared to maybe other owners around the NFL where they have no patience, and you can, yeah. whether it's the Eagles or Dallas or whatever the team might be. You can name them all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, uh, you appreciate her ownership and how she has their trust. In yeah. Her. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I absolutely. We we just have the best owner in sports. We just do, and and uh, I felt that way about Tom Benson too. And and Tom was more emotional, uh, Bobby. You know that. And yet, man, he just he just gives us everything we need to be successful. So what, if we're not successful, it's not on her, or it wasn't on him. It was on us. And that's all you can ask for in my role, um, and and our coaches and our players. You know we. There's never a, there, it's never no when we need something um, to help us win. And so that, that's so valuable. Uh, it's, it's hard to even describe. And we can look around at different franchises and different sports and say, ah, you know, the problem starts up here. Well, it doesn't start up here with our owner. She's fantastic. Can I follow up on that? Just speaking yes. of money, um, there's a lot of coaching openings. There's going to be a lot of assistant coaches in demand. Is that... Does that play a factor? Will that be something when you try to lure an offensive coordinator here that you can? Yeah, that won't be an issue. Okay. Thank you. You talked about enthusiasm. What are your thoughts on some of those games where the fan base, you know, were booing or, or sold their tickets to other yeah. fan bases? And how do you get the fans back into it? And well, you have to win. You have to perform well. It's it's it could, that's on us, you know. And and uh, look, there's a little bit of a double-edged sword. You know, we just watched the Detroit Lions and their season and how fantastic that environment is and, you know, winning for the first time in a long time. We experienced that here, right? We experienced it in, in, in 06, uh, 07, 08, 09. You raise the bar, right? We raise the bar. And that's a good thing. And so now that we've raised the bar, we've got to meet it. And if we're not meeting it, that's on us. Um, the only thing I really don't like is when we sell tickets to – the opposing team and get and allow, you know, a, a big group in our building. And look, that's popular here because New Orleans is a destination, right? When when um, our opponents look at their schedule and they see New Orleans, ah, that's the trip I'm going on, right? We we understand that. Um, it's just it's part of the deal, part about uh, uh, of being in a great city like New Orleans. So, but in terms of 
booing, the, the crowd reaction, that's on us. That's not, um, that's not on the fans. Look, if I was in the stands, there's a couple times I might have booed. I don't know. <laughs> Back to the question I asked about the age. Obviously, that's 50-something divided by something. But very clearly, some core players, almost everyone who's made an all-pro on this team, Demario Davis, Cam Jordan, Ryan Ramchick, Tyron Mitchell, yeah. are in their 30s. What does give you the confidence that this roster is, is strong enough in, in the guys in their 20s to, to maintain well, that level? Demario Davis was all-pro. He's 30. Five years old, 34 years old, you know. Uh, Cam Jordan basically played on one leg for more than half the season and was productive. And, and uh, so, you know, age is a number. I get to say that because of my age. Um, it's more about the performance. And so, and I like some of these young guys that have come along, you know, Alante Taylor and Paulson Adebo and, and uh, Carl Granderson. I, mean, we, we, I can name a lot of players, Eric McCoy, um, the receivers that we have, there's a lot of really good things. And, and look, these guys, remember this, around the league, these guys are under contract for generally three, three years, right? So it's not like you have them under contract for 15 years. You have them under contract for three years at a time, and then you make a decision. And so that's, that's just our league. You know, that's, that's what it's about. And so I'm, I'm comfortable with... I mean, I don't feel like we've got um, a particularly old team. And usually, I don't know what – I didn't see the one you're looking at, but usually the spread between the oldest and the, and the youngest is like 12 months, 13 months. So it's not like it's – you know, we got a team that's got a bunch of uh, 35-year-olds and another one that's got a bunch of 23-year-olds. When, when did you guys go up to, like, Trevor Penning not playing, Peyton Hurt, Turner being hurt, not playing, like, high draft the guys? Yeah. Not, how does that affect your, your roster building and your approach? Kind yeah, of it affects it. Um, um, listen, you can't – you know, these, these injuries are, are – um, I don't want to say coincidental. That's the wrong word. But they're not controllable generally, you know. Um, they, they happen. And, and look, yeah, I hate when it happens and, and you know, Peyton, for example, was doing some really good things and got hurt again, you know. So that's tough, but it's not like he's trying to get hurt. Um, you know, Trevor Penning's had a couple injuries that have slowed their development. And so that's different than misevaluating the talent. Um, so I, I don't know how to answer it otherwise. Is Trevor, is Trevor like a point where you got a, you got a contingency plan maybe going forward because it is maybe a little – Uncertain, like that confidence level. Well, maybe. look, we have a contingency. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> There's that cough. I mean, we have to have a contingency plan for everything. So, um, you know, inju injuries are indiscriminate. Nikki, when you look at uh, like last off season, said, okay, we got to play better against the run. You have to be disappointed in that. Where you think in your interior defensive line, you know, David on your model, Lee Shaito, and everything. Seems like we took a step back in that regard. We're basically giving up four and a half yards a run, and yeah. obviously not running the ball as well as we wanted. So that needed to be flipped, uh, you know, as far as what we get up for and right. what we actually average. So, uh, how is the disappointment uh, with us actually being able to stop the run consistently? Yeah, I, look, I think you go into any season wanting to um, wanting to stop the run, run first, right, and then and then pass second generally. Um, by the same token, you know, look, we wanted to improve in takeaways, right? in our takeaway turnover ratio. We did that. Um, we weren't as good in the red zone on either side of the ball as we've been in the past. And yet I felt like, man, back half of the season, we really improved in that area pretty significantly. So there's improvements that happen during the season, although the end result, the end statistic may not be where you want to be. So, you know, we're looking at all those areas and saying, okay, what did we do right? Um, why did we do that? And how can we improve on it? And then we're looking at the things that we didn't do well that we have to improve on if we uh, uh, expect to get a record and the results that, that we want. Um, it's a good question, though. You know, we've got to look at every one of those single areas and say, ah, we weren't as good as we expected to be. Why? What did you make of Michael Thomas this season? Excuse me? What did you make of Michael Thomas this season? Uh, look, I thought he was doing well and, and really excited about where he was. And then, look, we had another injury. It's, it's, uh, it's really difficult for, for, for us and for Mike that you have to go through that. He's such a great competitor. So, you know, wants to, wants to win so badly, wants to be out there so badly. And, and uh, 
you know, for him to get hurt again was, was difficult. With that being said, it seemed like the fans were led to believe, at least the last maybe couple of games, that Marshawn Lattimore and Michael Thomas would have been available. Yeah. They, no, if they, if they were available, they would have, they would have played. I know why uh, Dennis was asked this question. Um, it's been a long time since we heard like a prominent player booed at home in the Superdome. Do you think what Derek went through was a little too much from the fans? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the nature of the quarterback position, though, right? Um, you get more credit than you probably deserve, and you get more blame. It's, it's, it's what I said at the beginning, is that the easy and lazy thing to do with results is to blame the coach or the quarterback. Um, yeah, that's that's what that's what fans do. That's what the media does. That's what I mean. I hear ex players doing it, so and they don't really know, you know. Dennis said he he thought you guys were close to getting back to wherever you wanted to go. Do you concur? Well, I think I don't, close is a. Is a <clears throat> I think we have the potential to be a really good team. Now, I thought that coming into the season as well. And, but there are some things that we have to do collectively and individually to get there. And, and uh, you know, actions are going to speak a lot louder than any words. So we'll see how this offseason goes. But, yes, I'm, I'm excited about the potential of our team. Um, but we've got we've to do it. I mean, we've got to perform. With Dennis, are there schematic things you've been impressed by during his tenure here in terms oh, yeah. of this past season? Yeah. Dennis is a fantastic defensive coach. Fantastic. Mickey, uh, you referenced it again today, saying so you have some ground to make up in the cap. You, you kind of said in years past you want to maybe look at how you're doing that. And it, yeah. Is there going to need to be a little bit of a change in how you operate just with the, the management of it um, and, and with – the structures and board years and stuff, just in terms of like that cap money you guys are carrying all that? Um, I, I don't know the change is the right word. <clears throat> we just got to be conscious of, um, you know, making up some ground um, in the next few years, and, and there, there's different ways to do that. So, um, you know, and I, I've said this to you guys before, you got, yeah, sometimes you have to look beyond the numbers and you have to look at, Okay, how many guys are under contract? What's the roster? Where are your core players? There's, there's jo- lots of different uh, things to look at. You know, if, if you're $50 million over the cap and you have 30 players under contract, that's different than being $50 million over the cap and having 70 players under contract. So there's just a lot of different variables. With Dennis, sorry if this is dumb, but, you know, you, you've listed off Belichick and the records there of their mm-hmm. first few seasons. Does his Oakland experience just not matter at all? Because it would be. Yeah, it matters. If you throw that in, it would be year five rather than the first few years. Yeah, it matters. That? You know, they, it matters. You know, where you're at matters. The experience. Look, I, I think having any head coaching experience is valuable. You learn a lot of things, you know, your first time around. Um, again, you have to look beyond just the record. You know, what was the circumstances when he was in Oakland? You know, they basically were way over the cap. They had to tear down the team. You know, the quarterback situation – there was a lot of variables there that, and he was given a short amount of time. So you got to look at all those variables. Have you ever felt the need to have a meeting with the entire team at the end of the season like you did this year? Has it ever happened before? Um, I've had meetings with the team before. It's been a while. But I felt like there were some things that needed to be said to the players. Just like I think there's things that need to be said to the coaching staff and to our our football operations staff, and that's going to be said, you know. Um, again, I think I think maybe we've gotten a little too comfortable over the last few years, and so I want to make it uncomfortable. Yeah, how does that marry with, I mean, using that expression, we've gotten too comfortable, and also you guys made it very clear you didn't think the culture needed to change. You, you know, kept most of the staff after Sean left. Like, you know, what's the pros and cons of that? Yeah, well, you know, you're commingling terms. <laughs> culture is, is, you know, culture means a lot of things to a lot of different people. We've got great people in the building, so I want to make that really clear. we got really good guys, great representatives of the organization. <clears throat> um, 
hardworking. There's, there's a lot of really good things, but there's some other things that I felt like, you know, we need to clean up and, and, and uh, that we've, you know, l- let, um, I don't want to say slide, that's not the right word, but a few things that kind of had deteriorated over the last four or five years, that, you know, kind of core beliefs. And again, that's my responsibility. Uh, that's why I spoke to the players. And look, the DA spoke to the players as well. So um, it's, not, it's not anything different in, in terms of what the head coach does. What was last week? I know assistant coaches were away from the building. Was it was it you and Dennis and some other core decision makers kind of evaluating what are the major changes we want to focus on first? And, and offense came away as one of those. Or? Well, I um, look last week is uh, you know, the first thing. I don't think you ever make really good decisions in the aftermath of a season when it's still emotional, right? Um, so that's. You know, we're giving the staff off, and everybody was really off um, the good part of last week. But it gives Dennis an, a, a chance to, you know, give some thoughts and me, and you know, it wasn't anything formal. And the, the main takeaway, obviously, you said it'll bear out the results, or we'll see what happens. Yeah. I mean, since the offensive changes, I mean, does it does it feel like that is kind of one of the major things you've identified that that could change the fortunes of this team? Yeah, obviously, yeah. Is there one game this season that you look back and like maybe regret or think like that game could have changed the course of the season if you think back regret? Yeah. Yeah, there was a few things that happened that fourth quarter that were out of our control that I didn't like. That might have changed the outcome of that game. But there's always things. There's always a play here, a play there. I look, look, it's a, it's a one game, right? And changes the entire course and narrative of the season. When when that's happening at the time, do you think that like it? Yeah, like that game I do because, because I've experienced it before. Right. I don't know if it's not really the season you think. Oh, this like, is come back. I said to someone, you know, the last week we had to have certain things happen to for us to get in the playoffs. Right? We handled our part, but I've been in that situation in my career probably four or five times, and not one time has it ever happened like you wanted it to happen, right? Um, so I hate getting to the point where you're relying on someone else to, to you know, do their job for you and, and or do our job for us. So we can't put ourselves in that situation. That's, that that's on us. So when you watch Tampa do what they did as well, does that add to another element of it? Or yeah, yes. <laughs> they, they played a great game, and... and uh, um, have become a good football team. They've won a lot of games in the last, uh, you know, six, seven weeks. And it's a credit to them and a credit to their coaching staff and, and players. Keep interrupting, sorry. When you say uh, too comfortable and make it uncomfortable, when you have, like, a body of work like you do that combine the history, uh, is that kind of like maybe in 08 when Gary Gibbs left and Brett Williams got here in 13 when, like, Lance and Roman? Is that kind of what you're alluding to that maybe – a little bit of a change, or is that just a parallel that I just kind of made up? No, I, I think that's, you know, there's some similarities there. Yeah, yeah. Um, what, what's the what's the old thing about uh, keep doing the same things? The definition of insanity, right? So, yeah, we got to do things a little differently if we expect a different result. Thank you. I've got just a little more of a lead question. Um, officiating has been in the headlines a lot this year. I'm just wondering. Well, I'm trying not to talk about officiating. <laughs> At least cryptically. One of the most high-profile gaps uh, in recent history. I'm sorry, say that again. It, from your experience, as someone who went, who, who yeah. was a vic- victim, yes. of basically, but one of the most high-profile mistakes, admitted mistakes. Um, where would you say generally? This is not about specific calls this year against your team or anything like that. But where would you say? How would you say you feel generally about the evolution of officiating since then to now? Is it disappointing, or would you hope there would have been? More changes designed to minimize errors, or minimize the headlines. Oh man, <laughs> I'm not going to comment on that, uh, Brett. I'd like to, but um, you know, I have some thoughts, and, and I've shared those with the league. And you know, it's it's their responsibility um, above my pay grade. How, how critical do you think it is this year to get finally? fixed and get back to the playoffs? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, 
Look, I think every year is important to get back to the playoffs. That's the standard. That's the first standard, right, of a successful season, make the playoffs. And so if you don't make the playoffs, then I don't think you can say you've had a successful season. So we didn't have a successful season this year. You know, we want to have a successful season next year. So and we'll evaluate next season when next season's here. Yeah, do you have a window, as you were kind of talking about earlier? Do you guys internally see, like, that? You mentioned, like, player contracts and, like, three-year gaps. Mm-hmm. Like, do you guys view kind of a window for how this roster is built as well or taking advantage of a window? Um, well, I think you have to – I probably wouldn't describe it like that. I think you have to assess your team and, and have realistic expectations. Um but I think making the playoffs is a realistic expectation. I, I, I've said that that was a realistic expectation this year. And um, so we're close, but not close enough. I apologize. I have a really bad tooth. And I have a disappointment. You want me to pull it for you? When I leave, it's going to be clunky as hell. And, and I apologize for what I have to do. Uh, with Joel Thomas taking the yeah. – or headed to the Giants, um, First, was that a spot running back coach that y'all were considering making a change at already? And and also, just what are the well, that was, that was, getting? That was Joel's uh, uh, decision to, you know, pursue that. And you, know, you have to ask him about about uh, you know the reasons behind that. But Joel's a fantastic coach, did a fantastic job. Um, yeah. You could have blocked it though. Was it just? No, uh, I, I, I don't feel over. that's fair to do. Look, when when someone's been here for a good period of time and done a great job they have the right to you know self-determination and so um generally speaking that's that's how we approach it Nikki, have you talked with dennis about this that you can watch a number of games how you see poor tackling but then how do you practice yeah. tackling like, yeah. you know or just you see throughout the league right? yeah it, it Look, that's a good question. I, I think that that's one of the things that we need to assess is how are we approaching the off season? How are we approaching training camp? How are we approaching the preseason games? Because um, I felt like we got off to a really slow start in a number of those fundamental areas. And so is that a result of the way we're practicing? Is that a result of the way we play the preseason games? And look, it's hardest on your O line, D line, right? It's hardest on them because that's a, you know, it's a, it's a contact sport uh, um, in pads, and so what's what's the right amount of practice and and preparation for those situations? Same thing with tackling. You know, you don't we don't do a lot of tackling in in uh, in training camp or or you know, certainly in the in the preseason if you're not playing a lot. So. These are all the things, you know, look, I was, I was telling someone, you know, when I was in Seattle in 1983, we had, I think we had 60 three-hour padded practices for training camp, something like that. Bobby, you experienced it. Now we have 17, and they're not, none of them are three hours. And so, look, it's a different amount of preparation. I'm not saying that that was right to do it that way, but the preparation time is just different. And so we have to adjust to that. And... Uh, I think that's a hard, really hard thing about coaching um, in this era of football is that are we, do we have the right in, amount of time um, to get those fundamentals squared away and ready to go week one of the, of, of the regular season? It, and, look, I don't have the answers for it. Um, I'm not a coach, so that's, that's a coach's responsibility, but it's, it's something that we need to you know, talk about and, and examine. Are we preparing the right way um, you know, uh, uh, relative to the, the rules that exist? Does that examination include potentially like are we counting again for training camp like Greenbrier or something like that? Um, sure, yeah. All, all of it's open for, um, for discussion, yes. I mean, as, as of right now, you only have two picks in the first four rounds, maybe a couple of picks coming your way. Is that is that an area maybe where you, you seek to add to that pool just to kind of help with the, the financial flexibility of the roster? Um, yeah, sure, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, because look, you know, when you have a young player on a rookie contract, that's, that's, that's a different cost and cap than... Um, having a veteran player, so that it becomes part of the elements. But look, we, we, want to put, we want to put the best roster together that we can put together. And 
And uh, I've always believed, you know, you, you can acquire players in all, you know, all three forms, really, free agents, draft picks, trades. And so we're going to look at all those areas. And, and if we can uh, improve our roster, that's what we'll do. I mean, you're on the same lines as the question about practice and being able to practice, you know, full contact and things like that. Cam, Cam Jordan talked the other day about the changes in the technology uh, around the league and yeah. how, you know, the convenience of being able to study film at home, yeah. but then the complications that come with that as well. Right. How would you measure sort of the technological, technological advances of the league and balancing the conveniences, but also some of the maybe problematic things that can Yeah, I, I think that's part of the equation, you know, is that, is that, uh, Look, one of the, when when you when somebody wins a championship, right? One of the very first things you always hear is, "Man, we had great chemistry on our team. We loved each other. You know, we played for each other." There's a trust and, and a relationship, right? And yet, today we have, you know, and not, we're all guilty of it, particularly young people. You're at dinner and they're on their cell phone, right? They're on their they're texting. They're not conversing and. And, and developing that relationship. And so I think that we have to be conscious of that. Um, it's hard to develop chemistry and trust if you don't know your teammates well. And so, you know, in, in, in you know, 15 years ago or 20 years ago, there'd be a group of guys in the position meeting room watching film together after practice, right? Bobby, I'm sure you did that with your receivers and some of uh, uh, the other guys on your team. And you're you're conversing, you're watching the tape, you're watching your opponent, you're talking about it, you're sharing, you know, information. And today, you know, they go home with their iPad a lot of times and do that same study. So they're putting in work and effort, but it's just not the same. And so that's one of the challenges uh, today. And so we have to, you know, have a right balance between, between um, the technology and then developing the relationships and trust. question of just thinking about it. Mm -hmm. uh, the ability to maybe mandate certain things. Yeah, terms, not really. You know, well, you know everything's, everything's voluntary these days, but here's what, what's mandatory is a commitment to winning. Right? That's what's mandatory. I was kind of curious about the same things he was asking. So it's basically asking the players to, to do extra, I guess. So you can't say you have to comment and do extra film study because They've already had their film study in their normal meetings, right? Yeah. So does that fall to like the team captains to organize that, or or even leaders of the specific groups or, or whatnot? Like, is that entirely a player-driven thing? I, I, I think it's everybody. It's 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 you know, what do you want out of your career? What do you want as a player, as a coach? Me? What do we want out of this? And and it's what I said before, right? We all we all raise our hand when we say we want to win. And we all raise our hand and say, we'll do whatever it takes to win. But then you have to do it, right? And a lot of these things that you're talking about, you have to do if you, if you want to have a successful uh, a team. And so, yeah, it's, it's simple as that, right? <laughs> you know, get to work on your craft. It's not a part-time it's not a part -time career. You've got to work on your craft. And you've got to be thinking about that in some way, shape, or form 24-7. Um, Especially if you don't think the other 31 teams are doing that. What gives you, you know, the NFL is so close. It, the margin for victory is so narrow. Um, what are we doing differently? What are we doing better than everybody else? We, it, it's not just, hey, the roster's better. That didn't happen very often. Um, it's the teams that, that do the, the things necessary to win. And there's lots of, there's lots of them. There's lots of things. It sounds like it's Maybe like, not to diminish it to a like a qual quality over quantity kind of thing, but it feels like even if you're doing the film study away individually, it's a different quality of work than doing it in a group, sharing, communicating things like that. Is that is my assessment of that? Is like is that accurate or, or am I? Yeah, I, 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 look, we gotta get right back there. Yeah. You've done it, so ask him. <laughs> um, but I think Bobby, I see you nodding. I think you agree with me. Is that, that there's things that that. Uh, you have to be committed to do, and and it's again, it's not mandatory things. It's not it's not there's not a consequence. Um, 
There's not a consequence for not doing them. But, here, but here's the thing. Look, none of it's mandatory, right? And if we do every single thing, it doesn't guarantee that we're going to win. But if we don't, it kind of guarantees that you're not. Nick, how do you feel like uh, It seems like this is the NFL goal of where we're at right now. You can look when uh, that was over half the league. I don't know. I mean, it might have been right under 20 teams, whatever. We did all like seven and eight or eight and seven. Mm -hmm. and then you have one that everybody looks at where the 49ers are at. And you look at the Ravens. But is that ideal? Because all the fan bases, everybody wants to win. Everybody's not going to win. And it's every year at least six, seven, eight coaches get fired. And that's never going to change. Because everybody wants to win. It's demanding. But do you think that's good, the parity where everybody's hovering around 500? Um, well, my perspective is a little different in that, look, I was in the league before free agency, you know, existed, right? So you'd build a good roster and a good team, and then you could keep it together for a long period of time. And if you built a really good roster and you weren't losing anybody, look, you had these, these teams that year in and year out for a good period of time were really good. And the rest of us are trying to catch up, right? Um, now it's just different in that it's hard to keep an entire squad, a good roster together for more than three or four years because of free agency. I think that's a good thing. Um, I think every year, every city and every fan base wants to have the chance to win. And, and I think we have that in our league, and I think that's a good thing. And, but the result of that is, is look, you have, a, you have a few teams that haven't got their roster to the point where they can win yet. You've got a few teams at the very top that are really good, and then you've got the rest of us in the middle right now fighting to be, you know, 11 and 6 ver or 7 and 10. Yeah, right. So, and there's a lot of variables within that, right? Um, yeah, I, I look, we're the most popular sport for a reason. Uh, that, that's one of the reasons. Can you can you explain just your your personal philosophy or, or your the way you look at it when, when you're constantly trying to trying to be competitive every year instead of instead of taking this yeah. and looking at like a hard reset, blow everything up, you know, and, and wanting to, to extend the, that kind of. Um. I don't know if I can explain it. <laughs> you know, I just, I just look. I, I look at, I look at things. You know, glass half full. I, I, I look at a roster and a team and say, man, if A, B, and C happen, we can be really good. And if it doesn't, or you have some injuries, or you, know, you get some calls that don't go your way, then it, it goes the other direction. And, and look, we can point to these last three seasons: nine and eight, seven and ten. What was the year before? Nine and eight. And say, man, there were three games there that could have easily went the other way, and now we're talking about twelve win seasons, right? And, um, so, look, I don't, you know, I think we've got a good roster. I do, and I, I think that, uh, but we got, we got to do some things better. I, I probably didn't answer the question, but all right, thank you, guys.